Let's take out our Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 1. Yeah, Romans chapter 1, verse 19. Preach the word, yes, sir. You pray from, like I say, you pray for me as I do, yeah. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. The slippery slope. This is an extended, uh, I guess you can use that word, treatise, 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 that's the right way to pronounce it. A serious treatise about salvation, about mankind, and what God thinks of people, mankind in general. This has been called the most doctrinal book in the Bible, Book of Romans. And chapter one, chapter two, chapter what well, goes on, even three and four talks about this. It, it, uh, it's God's perspective, what God wants us to know about us, about us in our natural state. A lot of difficult things here to understand and realize, but also there's gonna be a good ending. Like that old saying says, now here's the rest of the story. So if I remember to, to do it the way I want to do this, at the conclusion, I'm going to talk about the rest of the story, too. Heavenly Father, please help me as I preach this morning. Lord, I got so many notes here and things I want to say. So Lord, help me to remember all this. Help me to see it on my notes or to think about it. But Lord, help me to preach this morning that people will benefit from this time. They'll be blessed from this time. They'll be convicted from this time and maybe Maybe someone to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved at this time. Would that be a wonderful thing? So Lord, help me to preach, please help me to preach. Give me clearness of thoughts and clearness of voice too. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I pray and ask it. Amen, amen. Romans chapter number one, we'll begin in verse 19. Now this message includes several things. You probably saw it in the bulletin there, the outline. Uh, different important subjects. We talk about knowledge, to have knowledge. Uh, we talk about glory, glory. Who gets the glory? A lot of people want glory and honor. We'll talk about the self, what God thinks about self and so forth. We'll talk about intelligence, kind of connect you with knowledge. You have to have intelligence to understand knowledge. So God has given us knowledge, hasn't he? And he's given us intelligence too, to understand the knowledge. And then there's a, the concept of God. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk something about worship, too, this morning. Worship, that's an important truth. That's an important practice. Worship. We'll talk a little about Thanksgiving. Maybe we'll even add in a little bit about creation. And God being our creator. That's part of these verses. Now, what this is talking about, of course, the book of Romans, written by, penned by, by inspiration of God, by the Apostle Paul. We're going to pick it up in verse number 19 and understanding that one thing I want to bring out as we start, where it all starts. Now we're going to read here and it's sad to say it's kind of a, a, a downhill slide here, beginning verse 19, going on almost to the end of the chapter. It's kind of a downhill slide, which is a sad thing. But I think one of the things we need to understand and realize and note as we begin, where it all started. Where did this downhill slide begin? And then secondly, you can also think about, uh, did it have to go this way? And no, it didn't have to. But where did it all start? It all started with God giving information and knowledge to people, to mankind. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God there it is, that which may be known of God, what people do know about God. Everybody has a certain amount of knowledge of God. Not everybody has the same, but everybody has a certain knowledge of God that God gives, that God blesses us with. We all have a certain knowledge of God. Now, the question is, what do people do with that knowledge that God has given them? Do they fight it? Do they go against it? Do they dislike it? Uh, because that which may be known of God is manifest. Now, where is this knowledge of God manifest? In them in us. Every person has a knowledge of God because that which may be known of God, knowledge of God is manifest in them. So everyone has a knowledge of God. Now, what do they do with that knowledge? That's the key. That's the, what turns out to be the problem. What do they do with what they know about God? 
Not everybody knows the same things. Not everybody has the same degree of knowledge, but everybody knows some things about God. But the question is, now what do they do with it? Do they accept it? Do they believe it? Do they um, learn it? Do they obey it? Verse 19 again, but that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Where is this knowledge of God? In people. If you're a people this morning, it's in you. It's manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them. God has shown these things. It's no big secret here about God and different things. Now verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. People can see this. Every day they wake up and look out the window or get in their car and drive out of their garage, they see God's creation every single day of their life. That's what makes them guilty. That's what gives them an understanding of God. The invisible things, uh, visible things give evidence of the invisible things. Visible things give evidence of the invisible. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, people see these things, being understood, they're understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now the Bible says everybody has this knowledge. Everybody knows these things so that they're without excuse. They know enough that makes them guilty. They can't make any excuses. They can't justify it. They are guilty. We are guilty. We are all are guilty. Now, now verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Glorify. We'll talk about being glorified. And the problem of glory. Who gets the glory? Him not as God. Neither were thankful. Thanksgiving. We'll talk a little about Thanksgiving. But became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Because God gave them things to understand. They understood it. They see it every single day. Everyone has the knowledge of God, but they turn from it. Now verse 23, I'm sorry, 22, 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They think they're smart, but they're not. In fact, they think they're smart, and they're actually just the opposite of being smart fools. That's not a pretty picture. Verse 23, and they changed the glory. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God. What did they change? His glory. They changed his glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. They start to, uh, look, to look to men like they should be looking to God. And to birds, a four-footed beast, and creeping things. Ever see some of these idols from some of these old nations that, that used to be around? And their idols are animals. Some of them are at least part animals. Verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to the imagination, uh, rather, up to the uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And you know what we're talking about here, don't you? Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. So they took the truth that God gave them, this knowledge is truth. They turned it, they twisted it, they, they changed it into a lie. And worshiped and served the creature more than the, capital letter C, creator. God is the creation. Anything, anybody speaking against creation and creator are speaking against God. Uh, more than the creator, who is blessed forever, amen. Now, verse 26, and for this cause gave them up, God gave them up unto vile affections. Vile, wicked, perverse, uh, vile affections. For even their women, even women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Even animals are more moral than mankind sometimes. Even animals are. Verse 27, and likewise also the men, same way with the men, Men are no better, <laughs> uh, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense, the payback for doing that, of their heir, which was meat. That's only right that they suffer some things because of that. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness. Is this really us? Is this really people? Now, again, like we said this morning, some are closer to salvation than others. Some are worse than others. Yeah, I know that. Some are not as bad as others. 
being, verse 29, being filled with all righteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, wow, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, you can't believe their word when they promise to do something, uh, they don't do it without natural affection, natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing, now verse 32 is uh, really pounding the last nail in the coffin here, who knowing the judgment of God, they know they're going to be judged for this. They know about the judgment of God. They know there's a right and wrong. Their conscience shows that. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. They've been told, don't do that. Uh, not only do the same, even after being warned about these things, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Their friends are the ones that do the same sins. Now, there is the rest of the story. Stay with me. I want you to give the rest of the story. There can be a happy ending. There can be a big change. There can be. Let's look, I'm going to look at my notes now. We'll talk about these different thoughts, seven different thoughts this morning about this slippery slope, where it all began. It all began with an understanding God giving knowledge and God giving an intelligence to understand this knowledge. So first of all, is God gives these knowledge, this knowledge. You know, in, in society today, we have, in schools, we have textbooks without God. We have schools without Bibles. Can you imagine that? They have schools without a Bible, and the Bible is God's Word, God's Word. So we have schools without God, because we have schools without Bibles. We have graduates without faith. They don't even know what the Bible says about things, and yet they have a certain kind of uh, knowledge. They've achieved a certain place. They're going to graduate. Uh, I'll praise the Lord for the graduates that are Christians. Praise the Lord for that. There's a big difference in their life, isn't there? But we have today schools, public schools mainly, textbooks without God, schools without Bibles, graduates without faith. What have they been learning in school all those times? Not to believe in God. That's what they've been learning. Sad, sad, isn't it? Uh, and yet here in, in these few verses here, God wants us to have knowledge. He says in the first couple of verses there in Romans chapter 1, verse 19, 20, 21, he talks about having known, you can know certain things, a knowledge there. It says that God had clearly showed, showed people things. He's shown them certain things that we can see. People see things as being understood. We understand. People understand things. All, the, all these blessings from the Lord, all this understanding, all this knowledge that people have, and yet they go the wrong way. They go the wrong way. They know better. That's what these verses are saying. People know better. So sin against knowledge... God has given knowledge. Adam and Eve, he told them, taught them certain things. It, that's why there's so much emphasis in our society on learning. Learning knowledge. We'll talk about intelligence here in a minute, too. But the knowledge right now that God has given us, so many things to learn. Isn't that an exciting part of our lives? Uh, isn't it true that many times when you learn something new, you like it? It's just kind of exhilarating. I've learned something new. I, I know something now that I didn't know before. I, when I went to church, I learned something about the Bible I never knew before. It's kind of an exhilarating, it's an exciting, even emotion and feeling, isn't it? To learn something new. God has given us knowledge. It's a part of Him, because He's all truth and all knowledge. And He's put it inside of us to excite us and give us something to enjoy. God gave us this gift, uh, this knowledge, where we can learn things. And it's an exciting part of our lives, isn't it? God blesses us in so many ways. Number two, another thing about this slippery slope, they rejected knowledge. Number two, there was a problem with glory. A problem with glory. Who gets the glory? On the back of the bulletins this morning, I don't know if you notice on the back of the bulletins, on the back side, or at the top part there, I've, I've been putting for really quite a while already, one, one verse, and I always put in big, bold print. And this talks about who gets the glory. Who gets the glory? Uh, not unto us, O oh Lord, not unto us. Why did he repeat it twice there? I think he was trying to emphasize something here. 
Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. If you didn't get it the first time, get it the second time. Should we put another one in there? Not unto us. What's he trying to say? Something is not towards us. What is this something that should be towards God and not towards us? But unto thy name give glory. Not unto us. So glory, glory, talking about glory here. For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake, give God glory. Not unto us, give God the glory for this. How many people do you ever see going around saying, praise the Lord. Give God the glory for this. Give God the glory. Um, who you're going to be thankful to about these things, we'll talk about that here in a minute. The problem of who gets the glory. Men want to be, they want, they want the glory themselves, don't we? When people look up to us and I wonder how many times our actions and our words and things that we do in our lives is really to get glory from people. We want people to look at us and like us. We want people to look at us and beyond like us, we want people to look at us and honor us. Look at us with admiration. Oh, the people, the people. Uh, why, why are, why are picture, pictures of people popping into mind as I think about this? People that want the glory. They don't want to give God the glory. Uh, uh, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. They want to have the glory for themselves. Well, when you accomplish something good, well, you can take some of the glory for that. You're going to have glory before the Lord someday. When you stand before him and you hear those words, if you deserve them, well done, good and faithful servant. You will get some glory for that personal glory. Yes, you will. But be careful here. Be careful. This can be a problem. Who's going to get the glory? Who's going to get the glory? The glory for the Lord. Give him the glory for those things. That's a big problem. Who are you going to admire? Who are you going to look up to and say, boy, they're really something, aren't they? But people today, they try to excel in all kinds of different areas so people will look up to them and say, wow, are they something? They try to excel in all kinds of different areas. They try to excel in, in well, in uh, athletics, sports. They try to be the best so people look at the, up and they look up at them and say, wow, look at them, aren't they something? They try to excel in maybe education. And you need to, again, the right kind of understanding, education, schooling, that's good, that's a good thing. But some people want to do it for pride reasons. So everybody will look up to them and their parents will be proud of you. But that's all right. That's not a, not a bad thing there. But in, in education, people push themselves because they want people to look at them and say, wow, look at them. They got a doctorate degree. Yeah. They're a doctorate. I know even in our Baptist circles, uh, people like to award other pastors doctorates. I'll award you. our church or our university, our Baptist University or Bible college will give you a doctorate. Almost the hidden message is I'll give you a doctorate if, if what? If you give me a doctorate, then we'll both end up with what? Doctorates. We'll both be doctors. We can go around people calling us doctor this and doctor that. The glory, oh, the glory works, worms its way in so many times. And what a problem that is. But who should get the glory? The Lord does. Can we share in that? Yes, I think we can. Well done, good and faithful servant. We'll hear that someday. And we can look at some good Christians and say, uh, that's a good example of what a Christian is. I, I, think, I think there's a, the right way of, to do that too. I think we need to look at people and respect them and encourage them in that way. Uh, but we need to understand who gets the most glory. God does. God does. Give him the glory first. Every talent and ability we have, there was one young man was in here, it's been several years ago now, visiting with his, I think it was grandmother. And he's, he's doing real well in school, still is, by the way, still is. Uh, but I talked to him afterwards and he said, yeah, I'm doing good. I heard you're doing, I told him, I, I heard you're doing good. Your, your grandmother's saying you get straight A's in school and everything. And he says, yeah. And you can tell he's a sharp young guy too, a sharp young guy. And I says, now, one thing remember, though. Who gave you that ability? Who, who gave you that, that ability to get those good? Who gave you that good mind that you do have? Remember that and give him the glory. And well, he said, I don't know if because he felt he was a little on the spot, uh, but he said, oh, yes, yes, I do. And then he never came back to church anymore after that. Oh, uh, who gets the glory? That's a problem. That's brought up here. There's a desire for glory for ourselves, for people's selves, that pulls them away from God. 
They take the glory that God deserves and they want it on themselves. There's the problem. There's the problem. The problem with glory, that's brought up in here in this slippery slope. Glory, who gets the glory? Number three, there's a problem of self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. The word vain there is used, vain, V-A-I-N, in verse 21. In verse 21, it talks about there, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. There's the glory, the glory problem. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, vain. They became self-centered is really what that's, that's getting into, self-centered. I made a list here, I think it's eight, one, two, three, five, six, eight, eight selves, that's a problem. Eight self problems, self-help, when you don't want God's help, you're gonna help yourself. I don't need any help. I don't need anybody to help me, I, I'll help myself. I don't want people to help me. Self-help, that's a problem. Self-esteem, no, self-esteem is not a good thing. Self-esteem is rising yourself above what you should be. You're, uh, you're ele elevating yourself above what you uh, really are. Now, God will lift you up, God will honor you when it's his place, but self-esteem, that's another self-problem. Self-respect. Well, you need to treat yourself right, absolutely. Don't disrespect yourself either. I'm not saying that, but be careful of just self-respect. You're gonna do this because you wanna respect yourself and you want other people to respect you too. That can be a problem also. Self-help, self-esteem, self-respect, self-confidence. Self-confidence, the confidence without God. I don't need God, I'm, I'm confident in myself. I know what I believe, I know what's right and wrong. I know how I'm gonna live my life. Be careful of self-confidence. Should we have self-confidence? Yes, when it's linked up with God confidence. When it's linked up with the word of God, yes. You can be confident in that way. Jesus Christ never expressed or shown any kind of lack of confidence. Did he ever? Never. He always was assured of himself. He always, of course, knew what he was talking about. Every step he took, every word he ever said, every act he ever did, he had confidence in that. And as Christians, if we're being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are also being conformed in that way. We're confident because of him. Not just ourselves, but when people talk about self-confidence, they are excluding God. They are not including God when they talk about self-confidence. My confidence is in the Lord, the God who cannot lie, the one who always tells the truth. Self, the problem is self, though. Self-help, self-esteem, self-respect, self-confidence, self-love. <laughs> I love me, who do you love? I said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Yes, yeah, self-love, be careful of that. We need to love the Lord. Now, we need to respect ourselves in the right way. We need to realize that what God has made of us, uh, that this is God's creation. Take care of it, treat it the right way, but be careful, you don't start to love it above God. All the martyrs who died for the Lord Jesus Christ, they did not love themselves above the Lord. They went through and did what they had to do. They were martyred, killed for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Self-love, be careful. God love, amen. Self-help, self-esteem, self-respect, self-confidence, self-love, self-pity. Oh, being sorry for yourself, oh, poor me. Uh, maybe that's coming even into Christians. Oh, oh I, I have this so bad, and I have that so bad. Self-pity. Isn't God taking care of us, Christian? Doesn't God bless us in so many different ways? Don't get into self-pity, feeling sorry for yourself, your situation. Yes, people do go through problems. The Bible says to mourn with them that mourn, and that's talking about Christians, too. But self-pity, self-regard, kind of similar, self-regard, self-will. There's the killer. There's the killer. Self-will. I'm going to do what I want to do. You hear this all the time. I want my rights. I want my rights. I want to do what I want to do. What they're really saying is, I want to do what I want to do even if it's wrong. I want to do what I want to do even if it hurts someone else. I want what I want. Self-will. Boy, there's a big problem with self. Glorifying yourself, uh, lifting yourself up. You know, I, I, I send a lot of birthday cards out. I like to do that. I like sending cards. I like getting cards, too. Uh, I like to send a lot of birthday cards out. And I go, 
Most of my cards, uh, birthday cards, I buy at dollar stores. Don't be offended if I sent you a birthday card and it was only 50 cents or a dollar. But understand the stamp costs more than the card nowadays. But anyways, I like doing that, but I go to the dollar stores and other stores too, always look at the card section. There's so many of these cards that, happy birthday, you are so wonderful, and God bless this planet when he, he put you here in this world, you know. You see so many cards like that. I almost, I look at those and I go, that's terrible. Now you need to have this in the right way, but there's so many of these syrupy sweet cards that talk about how wonderful people are. I'm so glad the angels rejoiced when you, I'm thinking, no, the angels rejoiced when the Lord was born, but the angels didn't rejoice when you were born. Just thought I'd give you that information this morning. Self-centeredness, self-centered. Self-help, self-esteem, self-respect, self-confidence, self-love, self-pity, self-regard, self-will. Some of those, to a degree, are all right, but understand they're from God. Give God our attention. Don't become self-centered. Become God-centered. Become centered with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. Is that leaving anything out? No. A consequence of the slippery slope, become, people become self-centered. They want to do what they want to do, and they don't care what anybody says, even God. Even God. Number four, another part of this slippery slope is the misuse of the intelligence. Intelligence we talked about already. God has given us an intellect. That makes an exciting part of our lives, isn't it? The intellect. Uh, what makes our lives exciting is the emotions, too. The emotions we have, the emotions we, ha we can have, and the feelings we have, that's a good thing, but of course, all of them have been deceived, distorted. There's another word I'm looking for. It begins with the letter D. Deceived, distorted, uh, something else. But all those good things that God has given us for us to enjoy, our intellect, to enjoy that, our emotions, to get excited at the right times, to be happy about the right things, not the wrong things, but a misuse of intelligence, a misuse of these things in our lives today. God gave us a knowledge. God gave us intelligence. And it is exciting learning something new. I have an intelligence where I can pick up this book, this Bible right here, and read it. Uh, I don't know if I've convinced everybody. I think you're kind of believing me because I'm the pastor. But try to imagine this. If you did not have and intelligence. Now, some people might be thinking, I don't think I do sometimes. Uh, I'm not talking about it. I'm just saying if, if that wasn't part of our lives, if that wasn't part of our intelligence, where we could, couldn't think about things and ponder things and make decisions, boy, we'd be lacking so much, wouldn't we? But we aren't lacking that. We do have that intelligence. Uh, and it makes life exciting. Schools are, are founded on intelligence, uh, teaching things, learning things, aren't they? Reading books, learning things. Intelligence, it's a good thing. It's a gift from God. Just don't misuse it. It's a gift from God. Praise Him for that. You have an intelligence. You can think about things, and you can improve your intelligence. I'm always trying to improve my knowledge. I'm always, and by improving your knowledge, many times you can improve your intelligence also. Uh, my wife, Carol, she loves to go on the computer. If I bring up any kind of subject at all, maybe some physical thing I'm thinking about, uh, this, that, or the other, she'll look on the computer right away. And we learn so much. You learn so much from the computer. And I don't even have to know the computer. Carol does. And I can learn through Carol. But it's kind of fun learning things, isn't it? That's what builds libraries. That's what causes schools to be here because of the intelligence and the understanding and this capacity to have intelligence to think about things logically, to think about things uh, in our lives, and to think about how everything works, this cre part of our creation of intelligence. We, we don't understand, and I'm sorry, we don't appreciate, but try to picture yourself without it how small your life would be if you didn't have that capacity that God created us with. What a joy that is. What a joy that God has given us their intelligence. All right, number five, another part of this slippery slope, the intelligence is used for the wrong way, the intelligence is used even against God sometimes. 
But there's another part of this slippery slope. It's a blasphemy of, the, uh, of having a lowered, a lowered concept of God. Verse 23, verse 23. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. When there's perfect, perfection, any change in perfection is what? Imperfection. Because if it's perfect, you can't improve it. It says here in verse 23, And change the glory of the uncorruptible, uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. They've lowered the image of God. Here they change, they lower the concept of God, what God is like, to animals. They, they change the concept of God to animals. Animals. That's one of the signs of the, well, not one of the signs of the last days, but that's one of the marks. People start to worship animals. They make, even make gods out of them and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, mankind. They make, built statues of men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, even creeping things. They change the glory of God into the glory of animals. What a huge step down. What a big slip down, isn't it? They lowered the concept of God, even to the place where they blaspheme God. Blaspheme God. They lower God in worth. He's worth a lot more than most people think. They lower him in worth. They lower him in love. They don't love him with all their heart and all their soul, all their mind. They lower him in love. They lower him in power. They don't believe how, what the power that he has, that he, that he can do, the power that he has and the things that he can do. They lower him in power. They don't believe he can answer prayer. I'm glad people come out on Wednesday night for prayer. Those people believe uh, God answers prayer. God, uh, they, those people believe there's power in prayer. They lower they God in prayer, power. They lower God in worth. They lower God in love. They don't love him as much as they love other things. They lo lower him in honor. They don't honor him like they should. They blaspheme his name. Some, some even insult him, ridicule him, dishonor him, slander him. They do not give him reverence and honor. Don't even come out to his house. Don't even read the Bible. Right. Say, Pastor, enough, enough already. Okay, one more. They lower him in fear. They don't fear him like they should. I know people, and you know people, and there's a lot of them in this category. I'll just say it like it. They're not afraid of going to hell. They're not afraid when they die where they're going to be. How foolish. How foolish. How far can they slide? How far can they go on this slippery slope? They're not even afraid of God. They're not afraid of hell. They're not afraid of the Bible, the Word of God. They're not afraid of anything. They lose in this fear of God. Uh, you know, over the years, we've called men God-fearing men or God-fearing ladies because they feared God. They feared God. Uh, they didn't want to step out of line. Now, by the way, I think love is a better motive. First John chapter 5 talks about that. Love is a better motive of serving God than fear is because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We need to fear God. We need to serve God because we love him. Don't just fear him because uh, you're afraid of him. Although if it gets to that place, that'd be better. That'd be better than not serving him at all. But love him. Perfect fear casteth out. I mean, perfect love casteth out fear. A lowered concept of God. They lower him in worth. He's not that important. He's not worthy of your time. They lower in time and efforts. They lower him in love. They don't love him. They love things in this world more. They lower him in power. Is a power of God unto salvation, Apostle Paul said. Salvation, God's salvation. Power, power that God has. Do miracles. The honor, they lower him in honor. They don't honor him that much anymore. They don't honor him enough. To them, church isn't important enough to come out for. It's not important enough. And they don't fear him. What I'm afraid of and what I fear is that they'll fear God when it's too late. Don't wait until it's too late. Now, today is the day of salvation. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ now, now. But they lower God in worth, love, power, honor, fear. Their God is much lower than the God of the Bible, isn't it? Much different. 
is much lower. And then also there's number, number six, there's a false worship too. They worship the wrong things here. They worship in verse 25. Look what they start to worship in verse 25. Who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature, the creature, meaning us, ourselves. We, we uh, got into a lie, worship and serve, worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Notice a couple of things here about this verse. Number one, it doesn't say that people stop worshiping God. It says that they worship people more than God, more. They still worship God, but they worship people more. People are more important to them than God is. That's a problem. They still worship God. They may even come out to church. That's all right. But they don't worship him more than they worship people. They don't love him more than they love, love people. They still worship him. So number one. Secondly, who they put in place of God? Man. They put people in the place of God. That's why people uh, are, are, well, they're almost deified, almost. If they've accomplished some great thing in this world, people respect them because they have a lot of money or a lot of prestige or a lot of accomplishments. And it's okay to do those things if they're from the Lord, yes, but uh, be careful of that. So number one, false worship here. They still worship, but they worship the creature more than the creator. They worship people more than they worship God. They put man in God's place. They put men in God's place. And they serve God some, but they serve themselves more. People come out to church when they want something from God because they're serving themselves. They're not coming out to church because they're serving God. They're coming out to church because they're serving themselves. And if, if God can give them something, if they need something, and, and they think God can give it to them, they'll come to church. But that's very self-serving, isn't it? That's that self-help, self-esteem, self-respect, self kindness self-love, self-pity, self-regard, self-will. Self, self, all for self. They serve God, but they serve man more. They come out to church some, but they serve man more. The worship, worship, they backslide on the worshiping. They, they, this worship is part of the slippery slope, too. They're sliding down, sliding down. And then the last I want to bring up to this morning is Thanksgiving, too. There's downfall on Thanksgiving. They should be thankful to the Lord, and they're thankful to others. They're thankful to people. They're thankful to themselves. Oh, I sure am wonderful. I sure am a great pastor. I sure pastor a great church. And all the people said amen. Uh, I, we sure are something, aren't we? You know, walk around like this and look at this. I got this kind of car and I got this kind of house. and I got this and I got this kind of notoriety and popularity. Oh, be careful, be careful of that. We need to be thankful to the Lord for all these things. All right, now these are some things that on the slippery slope but now let me give you the rest of the story. I don't want to leave you on this downward slope here. I want to give you the rest of the story too. So we're going to turn from Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 2. And then from Romans chapter 2, we're going to turn to Romans chapter 3. And then from Romans chapter 3, we're going to turn to Romans chapter 4. And then we turn from Romans chapter 4, we're going to turn to Romans chapter 5. <laughs> eight. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. And verse number 8, you're close. Now, what happens in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and into chapter 5? Uh, Paul continues with that discussion, like we saw the slippery slope in Romans chapter 1. But now, God didn't leave people there. God didn't leave people at the end of chapter 1. Now here in chapter 5, beginning at verse number 8, I want to read verses 8 through 11 here. God did something. In and of ourselves, we are chapter 1. And we can see this happening in our country today, too. Chapter 1. But now look at chapter 5, verse 8. But God, here's the difference. All these things happening, like I say, it kind of flows with this through chapters 2, 3, and 4 into 5. But God now commended his love toward us. In spite of the situation there in chapter 1. In spite of the situation you might be in. It says, but God commended, showed his love. Even though we weren't lovely. And we were not loving him. He showed his love towards us. God initiates this kind of spiritual love. God initiates these things. He starts this. But God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, there's chapter 1 and 2 and so forth, Christ died for us. 
Christ died for us. My parents, when we were growing up, my parents loved their two sons. Their firstborn, that's me. <laughs> they loved their firstborn. I was named after my father, who was named after his father, who was named after his father. Andrew, it's a good name. Christ died for us, but I, he, I don't think he ever would have died for me. He, he bought me a baseball glove. He bought me baseballs at times, baseball bat. He bought me a brand new bike one time. I like that, like that a lot. They were always present under the Christmas tree for their firstborn. But I don't think he ever would have died for me. Jesus did. Jesus did. Friends, God loves us so, more, so much more than anybody in this world. Christ died for us. Yeah, chapter 1 is true. Every bit of it, every bit of that slippery slope is true. In fact, it even gets a little worse as you go on there. But now, but God, commend his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, the blood's important, the literal blood of Jesus Christ, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That's the rest of the story. The rest of the story. Now, friends, Jesus died for you. If you're not saved this morning, if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, make that choice today. God can't make you accept him. You have a free will. All he can do is show you all these truths, and we can pray for you, and we are, we do pray for people. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to his forgiveness, his salvation, and only through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're seeking salvation, stop seeking salvation. Stop start receiving and seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you have him, you have salvation. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Believe that this morning. And believe the rest of the story too. But don't forget that first part, that slippery slope. That is 100% true, isn't it? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the rest of the story. But Lord, also for the eye-opening part of the story in chapter 1. That we'll believe that too. We'll believe that too, that we need you, Lord. We're so far People are deceived spiritually. They're blinded spiritually. They're rebellious spiritually. It's self, self, self. But we need to put you in that first place. What a difference. Every Christian that makes that decision, there's eternal joy in it. What a difference. They'd never, ever go back. Never go back. It's that good. It's that exciting. It's that certain. All those wonderful things. Lord, bless now as we have this time of invitation or prayer. However, people want to use it. Some come forward to pray about things. That's great. Maybe someone this morning to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe someone has questions. Maybe someone's convicted, concerned, fearful even. That's good. That's a good thing. The right kind of fear is a good thing. I pray, Lord, you Cause them to walk forward this morning, too, to show their intention, their desire, and their sincerity. So bless, please, bless this invitation. Please bless this prayer time now. In Jesus' name, with his authority and his power and his joy, we pray and ask it. Amen. Amen.